Pubertal assessment is the cornerstone of evaluation of any child with endocrine disorders. Unfortunately, in the busy pediatric practice, pediatricians are not focusing enough as far as pubertal assessment is concerned, primarily because of uh, the lack of time, but also about lack of inclination and complexity with which pubertal assessment has been taught over the last uh, few years. It's very important to understand that there are few key points which needs to be looked into pubertal assessment and if we have a quick assessment we can reasonably make sure in terms of pubertal status so as to decide about the line of management and therapy which can be guided from that perspective. So we'll begin with the breast staging for girls uh, which is the most important aspect for evaluation and we are all aware about the five stages starting from prepubertal breast development to papilla elevation to primary mount to secondary mount and finally the adult form. It might look complicated, but I would say that there are just two stages which have to be really looked into in a girl when the breast development is being assessed. It's stage two, which indicates that the papilla has started to elevate. And uh, this means that there is a time when growth spurt is starting to happen of around 8 to 10 centimeters per year. And from here till menarche is typically two years. And the growth will be around 5 to 8 centimeters beyond menarche. It's very important to differentiate lipomastia from breast stage 2 because obesity is becoming common and many girls are now being referred with complaints of breast enlargement when it's actually lipomastia. The best way to look forward is actually to put a thumb and finger around the areola and bring it closer. If there is a point of resistance, this means that there is a uh, uh, definite breast nodule or thilarchy has happened. If there is no point of resistance, it's indicative of lipomastia wherein no progress has happened in that regard. Identification of breast stage 2 is important because it would mean that now the girl would roughly have around 25 centimeters to grow, while at menarche it will only be around 5 to 8 centimeters. So if you have a girl at 12 years of age, height is 130 centimeters with just breast stage 2. You can roughly predict it will go around 155 centimeters, while if it is uh, at menarche, the child is going to land up uh, only around 135 centimeters. So we need to be really, really concerned. The second aspect to be evaluated very carefully is the formation of the secondary mound of breast stage 4, which means that menarche is impending and one needs to be very careful in terms of assessment. The other issue which is often encountered, which is a physiological variation, is the asymmetry as far as breast development is concerned. And this is very common, approximately 30% of girls would have some discrepancy, which may persist for a few years and even remains in adulthood. So it should not be considered pathological and the parent should be counseled about that. The other important thing to remember, particularly in terms of uh, uh, the evaluation of causes of pubertal disorders is the difference between thilarchy and menarche, which is typically two years. But in hyperandrogenic states, it may so happen that there could be sudden spurt of estrogen and with very soon after breast development periods of vaginal bleeding may happen. This discordant pattern of puberty goes against the diagnosis of central precocious puberty and should indicate a hyperestrogenic state like a ovarian cyst hypothyroidism or macune albright syndrome. What about pubic hair development? And uh, we all know that stage, uh, this is largely driven by the adrenal glands and therefore DHEAS elevation is usually associated with pubic hair growth. Usually pubic hair development is commensurate with breast hair development, but there could be a discrepancy. It may precede, happen simultaneously or may follow plus minus six months to one year as far as development is concerned. And in the first stage, there is no difference between the abdominal hair and the pubic hair. Starting of vellus hair marks the stage of pubic hair too. Then it tends to spread with more pigmented and sexual hair appearing with gradual progression to the, light, to the lateral side leading up to mid usteon. And finally, we have the adult height pattern. Pubic hair growth Axillary hair growth and axillary odor are indicative of what is known as adrenarche. And as I said, adrenarche and thilarche usually are commensurate. But in individuals who have particular disorders, particularly in the setting of adrenal hormones, like uh, 
congenital adrenal hyperplasia or exaggerated adenarche, they will predominantly have just these developments and not have breast development. Small for gestational age babies who are having rapid catch up are now having increasing tendency of precocious adrenarche, which is a forerunner of the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So if you have a young girl who is having pubaki around six to seven years of age, is not very tall for that particular age, was SGA at birth, had a rapid catch-up growth, one needs to be really concerned about the lifestyle of that girl, not only about the height outcome, but also about long-term complications which may happen subsequently. What about the radiological changes? Then a basic understanding is absolutely essential. The first and the foremost change which happens in the radiological appearance of a girl with puberty is the change in shape of uterus from a tubular structure to a globular structure in which the corpora to cervix ratio is increased. Normally, girls should not have any endometrial lining. So, if there is any endometrial stripe which is present, it is significant. Stripe of more than 3 mm means there is significant estrogen exposure and more than 5 mm means that there is a impending minaki. Unfortunately, often the radiologists report uh, endometrial thickness of around 4 mm in an 8-year-old girl as normal because that's a routine pattern they see in adult gynecologist. We need to be very cautious that this girl has no business of having endometrial stripe, means that there is estrogen exposure, requires evaluation and management in this regards. Another big source of confusion which happens as far as ovarian imaging is concerned is that these girls, because of the FSH predominant response, have multiple small cysts which are located around the ovary, throughout the ovary, and what is known as the multi-cystic appearance of ovaries. And this is often confused with what is known as the polycystic ovarian syndrome in which there are large cysts which are peripherally located. So you have a typical girl around 12 to 13 years of age who has probably just entered menarche, would have some physiological hyperandrogenism, acne, hair growth, uh, concern about that, slight weight, goes to a radiologist, they do an ultrasound and it shows that there are multicystic ovaries, reported polycystic ovarian appearance, diagnose the PCOS and labeled for life. So it's very important to really identify when somebody is reporting as polycystic ovarian appearance, which is 20% of the general population, whether it's actually polycystic or multicystic, and that we are not over-diagnosing polycystic ovarian syndrome in that setting. These are the cutoffs which can be used as far as the uterine parameters are concerned, as far as length for different ages, volume, ovarian volume, and these are quite useful when we are really looking at and interpreting the caution because often they would say the reports are normal for size and age but we need to really interpret as far as the reference ranges are concerned. What about the endocrine changes and we know that gonadotrophins are the first uh, to increase and in this regards if we look at the two gonadotrophins it's the LH which is a much better marker as far as pubertal development is concerned because it shows at least two to three times increase as far as pubertal stages are concerned while FSH tends to rise very quickly and may be high. So if there is one parameter which we have to look for precautious puberty, it is the LH level. And uh, both these parameters are secreted in a pulsatile fashion. So therefore should we have a pooled assessment of these parameters and a high estrogen level will obviously indicate precautious puberty. However, the word of caution about estrogen because estrogen assays usually particularly in the lower limit of their sensitivity are not very good. So they often will cause more confusion and the best marker to look at estrogen status of a girl is not really estrogen levels. It's actually the color of the vaginal mucosa which can be assessed by asking the girl to lie in a supine position and by spreading the legs and spreading the introitus and if we see the mucosa if it is pale and glistening it would mean that there is estrogen exposure which is there while if it is red it indicates that there is no estrogen exposure or it's prepubertal. LH is the best marker if the levels are more than 0.6 it means that the girl has entered puberty while if it's less than 0.1 it means it's prepubertal. In case of confusion we can give GnRH analog 
and see the stimulated levels which will give us an idea about the uh, actual situation in that regard. So we have this six year old girl whose height is 124 centimeters and we can see the breast development is quite significant. It's around breast stage three to four. She has impending minaki and therefore urgent action is required. What about boys? And in boys, the single most parameter to look at is actually the testicular volume. And it is a testicular volume of 4 ml, which means that the child has entering into puberty. And this is the time that we need to be aware of. When the testicular volume reaches around 10 ml, that is the time when the child is going to have really a growth spurt. And at this point of time, if a child is short, we can really ask them to observe for some time because the child will subsequently grow from there. Testicular volume is assessed using an ochidometer and we have from prepubertal to testicular enlargement increased penile length, thickness and adult form. And ochidometers are readily available which provide beads which can be compared to the size of the testis. And once the levels go beyond 10 ml, it indicates the child is going to enter puberty. So if you have a boy who is short at 13 years of age but his testicular volume 2 ml, don't worry. 10 ml, wait for 6 months, the child will grow. But if it's 15, 20 ml, do not wait. There is something wrong going on with that child needs, needs evaluation. So when are, do we need to be concerned about pubertal development? Any development of breast or pubic hair before 8 years of age is considered to be precautious in girls. If there is no development by 13 years of age, it is considered to be delayed puberty. As far as vaginal bleeding or menarche is concerned, if there is development before nine and a half years, it's considered to be precautious and beyond 16 years of age is considered to be delayed. For boys, development before nine years of age or lack of development by 14 years of age is considered to be significant. One needs to be really careful about these margins because girls often tend to present with early puberty when it is not really early at around eight and a half and we should not really over diagnose, but we should also not miss. And boys often present around 12 to 13 years of age with concerns of delayed puberty. And if we do not uh, look into the actual age and criteria, we would be over diagnosing and unnecessarily evaluating these individuals.